ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه سبحانه ونتوكل عليه واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه اما بعد at today's khutbah al jumaa quite a few people came up to me with different comments different questions all of which were positive actually and although we're not looking for the praise and the acceptance of the people if that happened for bihi wa ni'ma that's not the goal and the objective the goal and the objective is to put across a comprehensive and clear understanding of al-islam with its proofs so i decided to try to elaborate a little bit more because as you saw today 30 minutes is not enough for such a long topic, such an important topic. And as Abdullah ibn Mas'ul said, and also Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with both of them, and two famous sim- statements that uh, they made. Ma anta bi muhaddithi qawmin hadithin lam yablu uqulahum illa kan li ba'dim fitna. You will not talk to a people, talk to a group of people and you speak to them with speech that they don't understand, they don't comprehend it, except that it's going to be a problem. Today's khutbah is a type of khutbah where people in our community will jump up in the middle of the khutbah and they kick off. And they think that they're making an amr bin ma'roof and a nahi and a munkar because they're understanding, they find it difficult to, difficult to comprehend. What are you talking about? You must be from the CIA, you must be from the FBI, you must be from the MI5, you must be from those people, you must not like Islam, and so forth and so on. So there are a lot of issues we want to mention, like what all of the ulama of al-Islam agree upon, concerning this issue about burning people. There is a fatwa that has been issued by Daesh, a proper fatwa, because they have people who give fatwa. And some of the people who they look at as being their scholars, because we always tell this ummah, one of the proofs that show and prove that Daesh or astray is that you don't have any ulama with them. The scholars of Islam who are well known, wherever they come from, Afghanistan, wherever they come from, and I'm talking about ulama, you don't have, they have their own ulama. And there's a friend of mine who is an American journalist who went to Syria, and he's been doing research on Daesh, and he's been exposing them. So in the dialogue between him and them, he asked, name for us your ulama. And they gave a list of a number of names. The names were Abu Dujana, Majhul. Nobody knows who Abu Dujana is. Names Abu Ahmed. You don't know who was Abu Ahmed. They even named some people who we know are from the most ignorant people in Al-Islam. A man from Jamaica who used to be in the UK and then he was kicked out of the UK and then he went to Kenya and they had riots in Kenya and people lost their lives in Kenya and then he was flown back to Jamaica. They said that he was one of their ulama. And the list had people whose name was mentioned three times. His regular name, his kunya, and a lakab. So we have to be in issues like this behind the ulama of al-Islam. And this is one of the problems that I have to mention right now. You know the Muslims have a lot of tawa'if, they have a lot of groups. They have the Salafi people, the Ikhwan Muslimin, Sufi people, they have the Brailwi, they have the Diobandi, many groups, many groups. Out of all of those groups of Muslims, out of all of them, the Salafi people are the closest to the truth. A Salafiyah is the truth. A Salafiyah is Islam. But Salafi people don't practice and own all of Islam, but they come the closest to the truth. You have some people from Al-Khwan Muslimin, they have some good things with them. Some people who are Sufis, they have some good things with them. But generally speaking, all of the groups, the people in those groups, they are lacking. There's deficiency. But a Salafiyah is the truth. It is Islam. And the people who call themselves Salafi come closest to the truth, in my opinion. 
Why do I mention that? I mention that to say to brothers who are trying to be Salafi, don't become a person who is judgmental about other people. All of the Tawa'if, all of the groups, you have people who are overly judgmental, and this is when the door for extremism opens. You start to believe, like Daesh believe, you are the one and your group is the one and everybody who goes against you is an enemy. The kalam that I mentioned today and the kalam that I've been mentioning over the years, if I were to travel and found myself in Syria or Iraq, they would chop my head off. They would burn me because I'm from the Mukhalif. And this is how the Khawarij are. If you disagree with them, they will kill you. Not debate and talk bad. They will take your life. If you're an individual who calls Shabab for its reality in Somalia, and you go to Somalia and you get caught, they will kill you in Nigeria. Not only will they kill you, like in the case of Boko Haram, not only will they kill you, but if they can't catch you, they'll kill your family. They will kill your family. And they will somehow make that something that's justified because that's their religion, the religion of justification. So the first thing that I want to warn all of us concerning it, especially our Shabab, who are very impressionable, don't be a person who's trying to practice the religion and you exist thinking all of the truth is with you. You have to believe that what you're doing is right, but it's possible what you're doing is wrong. You have to believe what the other person is doing is wrong, but it's possible that it can right. Don't be one of those people, all of the truth is with me, and as a result of that, you become one of those people who are extreme, extreme, like the Khawarij. So with this issue, Khwani, Al-Imam Al-Shafi'i and the scholars of Al-Islam, when they talked about burning people, Al-Imam Al-Shafi'i has a book called Kitab Al-Um, and many people from our community are on the Shafi'i Madhab. When he talked about this issue, about burning people, he said, لَقَدْ رَوَيْنَا عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه ما ينبغي أن يؤذب أحد بالنار إلا رب النار إلا رب النار فأخذنا به فلا نحرق حي ولا ميتا. He said we have narrated a hadith. I know a hadith. Imam Shafi has a book called the Musnad of Imam Shafi. He was a muhaddith and a faqih from the fuqaha. He said I have narrated and I know a hadith where the Prophet said. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is not permissible for anyone, anyone, to punish someone else with fire except the Lord of the fire, and that is my opinion, that hadith. So therefore, it's not permissible for us to burn anyone living or anyone dead. One of the great scholars of Islam, Ibn Qudam al Maqdasi, he was Hanbali. He had a lot of special qualities and characteristics in terms of knowledge. But one of his characteristics is the fact that he wrote his book, Al-Mughni, which is the fiqh of the Hanabila, but he brings the position of the other madhahib. And sometimes when their madhahib is correct, he'll say that is better. And he was Hanbali. You find these people when they write books of fiqh, if he's Hanafi, he's only going to bring their point of view. Shafi, only going to bring his point of view. If the person is Maliki, only going to bring his point of view. And Imam Ibn Qudama, used to bring the other people's point of view. He would refute it sometimes, and sometimes he would say, and that's the stronger opinion. But what was he known for? He was known for his tremendous knowledge in the ikhtilaf of the ulama. He knows when something is ijma', and he knows when something has ikhtilaf. He said about this, this particular issue, I don't know any ikhtilaf between the scholars when it comes to the issue of the impermissibility of burning people. So what's the point? The Daesh, they issued the fatwa, and in that fatwa, they brought some crazy proofs from here and there, saying that some of the scholars were of the opinion that you can do this. And what they did was, they took the points and the fatwa and the kalam of the ulama out of context, and they applied their own understanding. They said that, our brother Mu'adh, Ghafarullahu lana wa lahu, the one who was killed, he was flying the plane and he was dropping bombs. And when he dropped bombs on people who were in that area, Daesh, 
Those bombs blew up and they burnt people. So just as he burnt people, we're going to burn you back. The ayat that we mentioned and other issues. They said that the scholars allowed this. Now, the ulama of al-Islam al-Khwani, they never left things unturned for us. You have in all of the books of fiqh, the chapter of jihad. You have all of the books of hadith, the chapter of jihad. You have some books specifically for jihad, like the book of al-Imam Ibn Abi Asim. He has a book about jihad, but it's just narrations, a bunch of narrations, which is good, but he doesn't get into discussions, just all of the narrations. One of the greatest books is the book by Imam Ibn Nuhas. Tremendous beneficial book about jihad. Our brother Anwar al-Awlaki. Anwar al-Awlaki. Ghafar Allahu lana wa lahu. Wa rahimuhullah. He gave an explanation of this book and he shouldn't have given an explanation because the book was too big. And it was being explained on other than the truth. It was being explained with desires. It's a big book, it's an important book. And it should be explained with sincerity and with knowledge. But the point that I want to make is there is a book by a great scholar who was from Spain, Ibn al-Munasif. Ibn al-Munasif, he died in 620. He wrote a book called Kitab al-Injad, Fi Abwab al-Jihad. There's no book like this in al-Islam when you talk about jihad. Kitab al-Injad, Fi Abwab al-Jihad. Ibn al-Munasif, no book like this in Islam about jihad because he deals with so many issues. And one of the issues that he deals with is burning people up, burning people up. And he brings that some of the scholars say you can burn people up, but when? You could burn people up when the enemy of the Muslims, they are in a citadel and they are protecting themselves. And maybe they have innocence with them, women, children, and there's no way of getting them. Can you take the catapult and throw something over there with fire? They said it's permissible. If there's nothing else that you can do and you were fighting at war, then that's permissible. He said, but it is the ijma of the ulama. It is ijma of the ulama that if the Muslim has the ability to get the qudra over someone and other than burning him, then you shouldn't burn anybody, anyone. For those of you who want to get that book, get the one with the tahqiq and the tahrij of a sheikh, Mashur Hassan Al Salman, from the Talamid of Sheikh Al Imam Al Albani. So, concerning this particular issue, Ikhwani, there should be no doubt in your mind, it's not permissible in the religion of Islam with the ijma of the ulama that you cannot burn people whatsoever. For issues that we want to mention about the khawarij, a few issues is that they're the way worst of all of the tawa'if in al-Islam. You know the Mu'tazila, the Asha'ira, the Sufiya, all of the people who had any hiraf, the scholars said there's none worse than the khawarij, and I'll tell you why, and we can see why. But first the Prophet, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hum sharru khalq wal khaliqa. They're the worst of the people. They're the worst of the people. That's a hadith in Nabawi. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And because they're the worst of the people, he told the people, in adraktahum laqtulannahum qatla aad. Wa fi riwayatan qatla thamud. He said, if I were to catch them, I would decimate them and I would kill them and destroy them the way Allah destroyed Aad, the way Allah destroyed Thamud. Now, if you ask the Muslims, how did Allah punish Aad? How did Allah punish Thamud? Our ummah may not know. That may not come to you. You know that Nuh, his people were drowned. Everybody knows that. His people were drowned. Ad and Thamud, who were their prophets and how were they destroyed? So that's the condition of our ummah, that we're kind of far. We have to go back to read, to understand. But if you go back to the Quran, Allah decimated them, destroyed them. So that's the mubalagha of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, concerning their evil and what he would do with them if he had the opportunity to deal with them. Al-Imam Ahmed in the book, the tremendous book, Kitab al-Sunnah by Al-Imam al-Khalal. It's one of those books like Sharh al-Sunnah, Usul al-Sunnah, I'tiqada al-Sunnah wal jamaa It's one of those books. Al-Khalal. He brings a lot of narrations of Al-Imam Ahmed about these different issues about the Sunnah. Al-Imam Ahmed said, Al-Khawarij qawmun su' la a'lamu fil-ard 
قَوْمٍ شَرَّ مِنْهُمْ Al-Imam Ahmed, he said, the Khawarij are evil people. I don't know anyone on the face of the earth who's more evil than the Khawarij. That's including the Rawafid, people who curse the companions. That includes the Nawasib, people who curse the family of the Nabi Ahlul Bayt, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullahu ta'ala, a man who has a lot of ittila. I mean, he read a lot. He was exposed to a lot. He debated a lot of the groups. He was an enemy to all of the groups. They used to look at him as being the symbol of animosity. He knew them all. He dealt with all of them. He said that the Khawarij are the worst of all of the groups. They are the worst and the most dangerous on this ummah than all of the groups. And one of the reasons for that, one of the reasons is the fitna and the facade. The fitna and the facade. And the Khawarij today, Ikhwani, are worse than the Khawarij of yesterday. Because you don't read that the Khawarij of yesterday were burning people. You don't read that the Khawarij of yesterday were taking people's heads off and chopping their heads off. You don't believe that. You don't read that. That the Khawarij of yesterday were doing some of the things. And many of you, many of us, who are not exposed to the Arabic language, you know on YouTube, YouTube has a lot of benefit and has a lot of problems. But some terrible stuff is on YouTube. Anyone who speaks Arabic language, if he went to the YouTube and he's been following Daesh from a year, two years now, a year and a half, the video footage that is available in Arabic will make your hat fly off. And I'm sure some of you saw some of it, some of it. And I don't think everything that they attribute to them is true, but there are things that are indisputable, indisputable. So the evil of the group comes as a result of what Allah Ta'ala mentioned about the munafiqeen that we mentioned, those 13 ayat, وَذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُصْلِحُونَ أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمَ الْمُفْسِدُونَ وَلَكِنْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ When it's said to them, don't make facade in the earth, they say, look, we're the muslihun. We're trying to do the right thing. So the religion with these people is something that they perceive as being correct but is harmful. It's harmful to the ummah, it's harmful to people. And as we mentioned, their victims more times than not are the Muslims. The victims more times than not are the Muslims. Very important issue, Ikhwani, concerning this brother who was killed. Did you know, and do you know, and have you considered, as Muslims we have to do something that's called the ta'zim of the nas. When a proof comes to you, Allah said it, the Prophet said it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you have to look at that thing as being big, worthy of being respected, even if you don't practice it. And you know you don't practice it, you can't just look at it and push it away. The pilot of that plane, do you know that there are seven people, seven people that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said they were shuhada, seven. Other than the mujahi fi sabilillahi, from them, the woman who died giving a baby, someone who has an intestinal ailment, he dies because of something happened to his stomach. Someone who was drowned is a shaheed in this religion. The Prophet said, Men is shuhada fi They said, He said, Who's the shaheed from amongst you? They said, The one who gets killed fi sabirilah. He said, Even a shuhada, la qililul. Then if that's the only shuhada, then there are only a few. He started telling them, The shuhada from our religion. Is the person who dies from a wall falling on him? Someone, a Muslim person in Palestine or something like that, the wall fell on him. Shalai is shahada. One of the shuhada in El Islam is the Muslim who died, the Muslim who died, and he was burnt to death. He was burnt to death. Nobody can sit here, not a single person can sit here and say, that man, Mu'adh, is not a shaheed. And no one can say, he was a shaheed. What we say is, there is an authentic hadith that would suggest he could be from the shuhada. Hey, you killed that man in that type of way because in your mind, Daesh, he's a kafir, he's a murtad, he's with the tawahid, so he's outside of Islam, so it's impossible to be a shaheed. But with the people of Islam, we say, hey, hey, I wouldn't want my son Thabit to be an airplane pilot in the Jordanian government. I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want that. 
But if he found himself as a pilot, you're going to throw my son outside of the fold of Al-Islam. The leader of Jordan told my son, Allah forbid, I want you to take this flight and I want you to fly over there and do reconnaissance. Just go and see what's going on and come back. I wouldn't want my son to do that. I wouldn't want my son to be involved in that at all. But if it happened, la samah Allah, if it happened, you're going to throw my son outside of Islam because of what he's doing. Just like that. It's not our religion. As I told you, the brother here with the scarf, this brother sitting right here, this brother right here, Abu Islam, every single person sitting here. If I came and I started judging your situation, just from my angle, I'll put everybody here outside of Islam and everybody will be in the hellfire. Everybody. And you'll do the same thing with me. But that's not our religion. Our deen is predicated upon knowledge and justice and al bayan and so forth and so on. That's one thing about this particular individual that we should consider. Another thing is what the Prophet said about the Khawarij, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as it relates to the pilot Mu'ad. Ghafar Allahu lahu wa lana. The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Tuba liman qataluhum. Wa tuba liman qataluhu. The Jannah is for the person who fights against the Khawarij. Because he was encouraging the Muslims. When you have the ability, then you fight them. And the fight can be with the sword. The fight can be with your tongue. The fight can be by writing, by educating. The important thing is, he encouraged the Muslims not to be supportive of that. <laughs> he said, the Jannah is for the one who fights against them. The scholars who wrote books against them, who gave their descriptions and stood against them. And also, Jannah is for the one who they kill. The person who they kill, the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gets a Jannah. So that's an issue that should be considered. And the reason why I'm bringing that to your table, to the table is, I think it's really important as Muslims that we make the ta'zim of the nas. You know, one of the terrible people, personalities, one of the personalities in Al-Islam who is a bit of problem, problematic is Yazid. Yazid, Ibn Mu'awiyah, Ibn Abi Sufyan, radiyallahu anhum. Yazid, he did a lot of bad things. He did a lot of things. His father was a companion, and his grandfather was a companion. In Sayyid al-Bukhari, the Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first army in Islam that wages a military campaign in the water, a naval campaign. Prophet never fought on the water. He never fought in the ocean against the non-Muslims, never. He said the very first group of Muslims who fight in a naval campaign, their, their emir is gonna be in Jannah. They, they are going to be in Jannah. The emir was Yazid. Yazid did a lot of stuff. He did a lot of evil things that were well known. And Imam al-Dahabi in his book, Sir Alam al-Nubala, he said, you know this Yazid, we hate him for what he did. We hate him for what he did. But his situation is with Allah. The ultimate final determination is with Allah. Because the Prophet said about him or the group of people that he was the emir over that military campaign that they're in Jannah. Now I don't care how much you don't like Yazid. That's a hadith of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when the Muslim sees the hadith, he's going to back up. He's going to take it easy. Take it easy. The Khawarij, they don't have that ability, and emotional people don't have that ability. It's similar to King Abdullah. Rahimahullahu ta'ala. Wa ghafarallahu lana wa lahu. King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, who died recently. King Abdullah. If you look at what the Muslims are saying, Muslims are emotional. We're not people who are scholastic, and we're not people who are fair and just. King Abdullah, Allah knows best. Allah knows best where his final abode is going to be. Allah knows best. But you know in our religion, the Nabi, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, any Muslim, and he didn't make any exception, he said, any Muslim who dies on Friday night or during Friday, Allah is going to protect him from the adab of the qabr. That's a hadith. So he died on Friday night. The Muslim comes today and he says, no, he's a munafiq, he's a kafir, I'm glad he died, he needs to be in the hellfire. Who talks like that? And which person exists like that? Who? Who exists like that? Who in his right mind? 
the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the famous hadith told us about the lady who was the prostitute, akramakumullah. Lady was a prostitute. That was her job. And she went to Jannah and Allah forgave her. Allah forgave her because she gave water to the dog. He said about himself in the Quran, Wasiat rahmatuhu kullishi. Allah's rahmah has spread over everything. And then the Muslim comes with this khariji mentality. Allah's rahmah is why? why? But the ignorant, the jahil person, he comes and he restricts it. Like the Bedouin who was jahil, radiyallahu anhu. The Bedouin who urinated in the masjid. Oh Allah, have mercy upon me and Muhammad and don't have mercy upon anyone else. That's the understanding and the dua of the ignorant one. The one who doesn't have a lot of knowledge. The one who had knowledge said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Arabi, hey Arab, hey Bedouin, you have restricted something that's very wide. So because the Muslims have such hatred for our hukam, and they hate us as well, whenever there's a hakim like King Abdullah, if you don't speak bad about him, then you're with the MI, MI5. You're with the, with the CIA. You're with the NBC and the CBS and the BBC. No. The nuss is in front of you. And our religion is not like that. How would you feel? How would any of you feel? My brother over there with the glass and the green hat. How would anybody feel? Anybody. The sheikh sitting over there on the, on the wall. Someone comes and he says, I know about your personal life. You did this, you did that, you did that, and I think you're doing this, and I think you're doing that because you live in Canada, and that's the area you live in, and your car is new, so you must be in Reba, and this and this and this, and, and I hope you die and go to the hellfire. Who thinks like that? Who in his right mind thinks like that? No one here, no one, myself included, not a single person sitting here, not a single person sitting here can allow himself to exist I mean, we're trying to practice. We're in the masjid right now. I'm giving a talk, trying to give dawah, trying to educate, trying to remind you. You're here, and you sat, and you waited for me to come, and we're here waiting, and we don't have to be here. So all of those are signs and indications that we're trying to be decent people, practicing people. And with all of that, if any and all of us look at our own personal lives and what we're doing and what we're not doing, who in his right mind is going to live and exist? King Abdullah is in the hellfire, and, and I'm in the jannah with Jibril and Mikail. The companions were not like that. Ibn Abi Mulaika, he said, I met 30 of the companions. Adraktu thalathin min ashab al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kullu wahid minhum yakhsha ala nafsi nifaq. La yakulu ahduhum ana ala iman Jibril aw Mikail. 30 of those companions, I met them, 30. Just imagine. 30 companions, I met 30 of them. Every single one of them that I met, he was afraid of hypocrisy on himself. He was afraid that he had characteristics of a munafiq. None of them, not one of them said, I'm on the iman of Jibril and Mikail. None of them said that. So in these types of issues, it requires a level of fiqh, faham, some wara. It requires a person just taking it easy and don't be so judgmental. Another issue, Ikhwani, is what the Prophet said about the Khawari Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what we have to know about Daesh. In a long hadith, there are many hadith, at the end of one hadith he said, in describing them, Kullama kharaja qarnun quti'a. Every time a group of Khawarij come out, they will be cut at the base, they will be dealt with. They won't be successful. And he said in this hadith 20 times, he repeated it 20 times. Every time a group comes out, they will be cut off. Every time a group comes out, they will be cut off. Every time a group comes out, they will be cut off. He said it 20 times, leaving no doubt in the mind of the companions. Radiallahu anhum that, that the intisar and the nasr is not for the khawarij and to the khawarij. If anything, when they come out, they're going to make fitna and fasad. At the end of the hadith, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hatta yakhruju fi aradi ad-dajjal. Hatta yakhruji, hatta yakhruja fi aradi him ad-dajjal. Every time they come out, they will be cut off. Another group comes, they will be cut off. They won't be successful. Daesh is not going to be successful. Allah knows what's going to happen in Al-Iraq. Allah knows better. 
Ibn Taymiyyah said, doing his time, doing his time about the Khawarij. He said, if they ever get hold of Al Iraq and Al Sham, they're just going to spread fitna and fasad, as if he's living with us right now. He was talking about them doing his time. And he mentioned Al Iraq and Sham because they were the two big places of the Muslims at that time. He said, if these people ever get control of Al Iraq and Al Sham, they're going to make fitna and fasad. The Nabi said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in that hadith we just mentioned, every time they come out, they will be cut at the base, prevented, until they come out and they're going to be from the supporters of the Dajjal. They're going to be the ones who support the Dajjal. And you know, the Dajjal, Ikhwani, the Dajjal, his Ansar are going to be some Yahud. When he comes out, they're going to be Yahud who want to be supporting a Dajjal. And along with them will be the Khawarij. So when the Muslim is sitting there and he's trying to figure out these issues about al wala wal bara please understand what I'm saying, Akhi. Please understand what I'm saying. Some people, they have a very uh, romantic picture of al-jihad. I mean, they really have a romantic... Jihad is not easy. Jihad is tough. And the way we are in our lifestyles, most people can't handle... The mashaqat of al-jihad. I am not here apologizing to anybody about our religion. Whether it's the khalifa, the khalifa, al-khilafa, al-jihad, whatever it is. That's from our religion. And if the abwab of al-jannah is through that door, then we ask Allah Ta'ala to make it easy for us to do it, but do it the right way. My point is, as a person, a young man, he sits there and he's really mutahamis. He has a lot of hamas. He has a lot of hamas. Everybody knows the Dajjal and his evil and his fitna. Why would the Nabi of Al-Islam put the Khawarij from the Ansar of, a, of the Dajjal? It's because their Shar is Mustatir. It's Arid. Their evil is, 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 for the one who has a mind to reflect, their evil is serious. This is not some theoretical discussion where you just like, you know, the man has long hair, and it, this is more than that. This is about the spread of Islam or the way that people stop Islam from spreading. People are using our religion. Some people have sincerity. Some people have sincerity. But some of the people, sincerity is not enough. You have to know what you're doing. You have to be able to weigh the benefits and the harms and then we make decisions based upon that. And most of us don't have that ability. Who has that ability? Scholars. We have that ability in our own personal lives and certain issues because it's our lives. You weigh the ups and the downs, the masal and the mafasid. But when it comes to the blood of the people, the furuj of the people, you know, when it comes to spilling people's blood, that's serious. When it comes to making the furuj halal, the furuj means the private parts. Private parts don't become halal in Islam just like that. So someone's daughter, someone's daughter, she's young, she's impressionable. She's easily impressionable. She wants to have a baby, and that baby, she wants to be a mujahid. So what she does, she's pumped up. She sees some of those videos, guy got long hair, and she wants to do the right thing. She winds up, she leaves in the middle of the night, and she travels to Syria. When she gets there again, again, when she gets there, it's your job, it's your responsibility. Send that girl back to her father. Send that girl back to your brother. La yu'minu ahadukum. Send that lady back to her, to her father, your brother. They don't do that. They make the furuj halal. Who does that? Who does that? In any masjid in Toronto, any masjid, where a lady from your community, your families can come to the masjid, get married without knowledge, uh, without the knowledge of the awliya, the wali and stuff like that, if that were to happen, there's going to be a problem because that's fitna and fasad. So we want to finish here, Ikhwani, by mentioning, just as we study about the khawarij and we, about the dajjal, uh, we should study these hadith about the khawarij. But even more important than that, because maybe you don't have to study anything about the Khawarij, the main goal and the objective of our advice today and right now is pump your brakes and slow down. Just take it easy, especially you youngsters. There's 
an article that came to me from Ottawa about extremism. And they have a picture of a revert brother on the front page with his uh, magazines. And the way they wrote the article about the mentality of the extremists. Our kids are impressionable. Many of them are vulnerable, vulnerable. The kid's father is not on the scene. He was into the street, into drugs and so forth and so on. He was in prison. Now he gets out, he embraces the religion. He wants to do something. He is vulnerable. And then here comes someone and he manipulates that underdevelopment of his mentality. And that's why that scholar in Al-Islam Al-Imam Abu Bakr Ayyub Sakhtiani, Abu Bakr Ayyub Sakhtiani, he said from the greatest favors that Allah could bestow upon a young person is to guide the young person to someone of the sunnah. Because if the young person hooks up with the person of the sunnah, he's going to be impressionable towards that which will give him life, that which will help him. But if the young person is guided towards someone who is not of the sunnah, he's of innovation, he's of evil, then he's going to be impressionable and vulnerable. And as a result of that, he's going to make decisions that ultimately will lead to his destruction. Lead to his destruction. So let it be clear. All of these issues that we're facing right now, the source of all of that is lack of knowledge. The source of all of it is lack of knowledge. All we have to do is just relax a little, get more knowledge of our religion, and collectively do our job to deal with this issue of extremism. By doing what? Every father, every parent, finding out what, it, what, it, what is your child saying and what is he doing? What is he saying, what is he doing? Do you remember I talked about the munafiqeen here and still talk about them? In that hadith about those munafiqeen who were talking and they said about the Prophet wasallam and his companions, they said, one of them said, I have never seen a group of people who are as greedy as these, meaning the Prophet wasallam and his companions. This man said, I never saw someone as greedy as these people. And I never saw someone who lies as much as these people. And I never saw anyone who, when it's time to eat the in, meet the enemy, they are cowards like these people. One of the companions was there. His name is Awf ibn Malik. Awf ibn Malik, when he heard that, he said, Kadhibta, and you're a munafiq. You lied, and you're a munafiq. I'm going to tell the prophet on you. Awf ibn Malik went, and he told the prophet. But before he got there, the ayat had came down already. Before he got there. قُلْ أَبِ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِهِ وَرَسُولِهِ كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَهْزِيُونَ لَا تَعْتَذِرُوا قَدْ كَفَرْتُمْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ It got there. Tell them, tell them. Do you play around and you mock Allah? Do you mock his ayat? Do you mock the messenger? Don't give any excuses. You kuffar. After you have believed, you kuffar. Now what's the point about this? The point is, Awf ibn Malik. When he heard what he heard with his own ears, he made inkar. He defended the Prophet and his companion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He defended the Muslims. And then after that, he went and he told the authority what happened. You don't call that namima. Namima, namima is when you hear something from him and then you go and tell somebody else what he said and then you bring it back. He didn't make namima. He's not a namam. He's not carrying tales. That's his religious responsibility to go to the person, to tell this person, this guy is saying this about you and that, so that he can defend himself in his honor. You know where I come from? In America, where I come from? We have a rule, a law of the street. It's not a law of Islam. They say, hey, if the police come to your house, you don't know anything. They knock on your door, they say, hey, you see that? It was a car accident, it was a parked car. Someone hit the parked car. You know about it? He said, I don't, I don't know anything. I don't know nothing. That's not our religion. That's not our religion. It depends on the situation. But anyway, the point is, Awf ibn Malik, he didn't make Namima. That wasn't Namima. So I'm telling you this to say what? You know if there's a boy, the son of someone that I know, and I see that boy in downtown Toronto behaving in a way that's inappropriate, I go to that boy, I say, hey, you know, I saw what you did. I'm going to tell your parents on you. If I go and tell his parents on him, 
That's not Namima. I'm not a rat. I'm not ratting him out. That's the hawk that his father has on me, his mother has on me. Now, if I don't have to go to them, inshallah, maybe I could just handle it and not expose him. If I can talk to him in a way to cool him out, that's my religious obligation. That's his hakami, his parents' hakami. That's not Namima. Similar to that. If you know a person in this society, a Muslim, who's about to do something crazy, he's going to travel to Iraq, he's going to travel to Syria, that individual's going to blow somebody up here, kill somebody here. You heard about that. You have a religious obligation, you do, to stop that problem in the way that's best. You go to that person and say, what are you, about, what, what are you doing? And if that works, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. But if that doesn't work, you got to go to the next step. You have to tell his parents. You have to tell the people in the masjid. You have to tell people who can do something about it. If that doesn't work, then you have to tell the authority. You have to tell the authority. And if you don't, in the religion, you're complicit. In the religion, you helped him to complete what he did. Umar told the people, if, if, 100 people of, of, of a Sana'a, 100 people of Yemen, if they all help to kill one man, I'm going to deal with all 100 of them. I'm going to deal with all of them because they're all guilty. They're all complicit. The one who held the knife or the gun, he's complicit. The one who gave him the gun is complicit. The one who let him sleep in his house the night before is complicit. The ones who went with him are complicit. All of them. All of them. So we have a religious responsibility, Ikhwani, to be proactive. Don't become people who are, you know, paranoid and we think everybody is doing this. But if it comes to us and comes to our knowledge, Allah Ta'ala has made it an obligation upon us to take care of public safety. And that's one of the most important aspects and benefits of Al-Islam. Al-Istiqrar wal-Amin. Stability and public safety. Stability and public safety. So this is what we wanted to present to you brothers here today. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us and to accept it from you. And that you understood and understand my words in the way that I needed and wanted them to be understood. In the way that I needed and I wanted them to be understood. People are trying to be balanced and they're trying to be on Islam. We're not for kufr. We're not for shirk. We're not for innovation. We're not for dhulm. We're not for ihana being put down. We want the Muslims to be put up. But Muslims are not going to be put up based upon vulm, based upon things that are not legislated in Allah's religion. So we'll stop here, inshallah, Azza wa Jal, and I believe it's Salat al Isha right now. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa nassal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at tawfiq wa sadad. Ami Shaykh al Muaddin al Mubarak. Kayfik ya Shaykh. Tamam?